if possible. So, yeah, we'll, we'll be going back 16 years ago when I contracted this disease. And it's not the usual disease of uh, pulmonary. I had tuberculosis in the brain, uh, TB meningitis. It happened to me right after two years of practicing my job as an architect. So I, I was doing my work and, of course, doing all of these, uh, we'll call this um, extra overtime work for me to be able to, to actually have a good career. And, of course, transfer to another country and then elope with my husband, with my husband now. That was, a, that's a, that was the whole idea 16 years ago. But this happened to me unknowingly. It was actually transferring from, a, from pulmonary to the back of my neck. And then there, it's basically eating up the, the covering of my brain. And then I collapsed on the New Year's Eve of 2006. That's when they just couldn't understand what's happening with me. They just said it's just a normal flu, fever, just migraines. But turns out the bacteria is already eating my brain in and out. And there they did not diagnose me properly. There were no tools that I'm, no means to actually check anything, uh, any bacteria or virus in my spinal fluid. That's why they just assumed it's tuberculosis, but they don't know what kind, what mutation. So they let me try the first time medication, six months, four tablets, I mean, four types. But I think at the time it was around 10 to 16 pieces. And then uh, on my sixth month, they rushed me again to the hospital because my neck was actually blowing out of proportion. And then just they, they told me, sorry, we did not expect that the three out of the four medications don't work in your body. It turns out you're a resistant case. You'd have to triple the duration and then double the medication. So there, I ended up having... Uh, drug-resistant tuberculosis for 24 months. That's back in 2007 to 2009 and lost my vision completely. And yeah, that's what I've been advocating now, how to lessen these kinds of irreversible effects, get these new tools so that nobody has to suffer the way I did. And of course, uh, being in this kind of triple discrimination women, woman, a person with disability, and also a person who had tuberculosis. Those are the, always, uh, I've been consistent with uh, the advocacy I've been doing this second time around in the UNHLM. Because now I'm, I'm hearing a lot of cases regarding they live in a faraway uh, region, far away, Jira, geographically isolated, disadvantaged areas, and they have no means to actually go and uh, take these tests, which is across the, across the what do you call this, um, the sea or the the river. So those, are, those are the kinds of challenges I've been hearing and a good thing we have those evidences virtually. We're, we're getting all of these reports via our social media. But up to now, who is going to be the one to uh, provide that kind of um, accessibility? So that's for those without a, a disability, for, for instance, that they're just apparently not able to provide that that um, financial uh, we call this um, support to, to these people who are living far away. So that's that's one area. What if they are woman with children who cannot leave their kids uh, at home because nobody will be able to take care of these of these uh, kids so it's another factor what 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 more if you have a disability who will bring you to these um, molecular molecular testing who cannot be handheld so I, I I can see I can see clearly that that's really the key we have to know how to convince people how to to make their their themselves uh, healthier. So yeah, I may not design structures anymore, but I know how to design healthier lives. So welcome friends to another episode of NTV Dialogues 90 for 90 Global Voices series. Since the governments have committed to NTB and deliver on other sustainable development goals in 2015, over 90 months have passed by and less than 90 months are left to deliver on those promises. Sadly, we uh, in the world, the progress to NTB is mostly not on track. And uh, uh, there's a lot more we can do with the resources we have, with the powerful advocates we have. There's no excuse for uh, inaction when it comes to TB as it's a human rights imperative. So today we have a very special guest, a very powerful voice for force for change when it comes to people-centric, community-centric, TB responses on the ground, and she's no other, other than uh, Madam Louis 
Zipeda Teng. She is a TB survivor and founder of TB People in Philippines. So welcome, Louis. Can, uh, thank you so much, Bobby, for, for this invitation. And uh, good day to all of your um, listeners. Thank you, Louis. Thank you. So we can begin with the UNHLM also. What uh, what yes. uh, the world leaders uh, committed in twenty eighteen? But if you allow me, can you can you please tell all of us that uh, how a bacteria which we can't even see it from our eyes can change lives? Uh, what were you doing before you uh, this uh, bacteria which could be inside me as well as I come mm -hmm. from India and so many of us have yes. uh, this. So can can you please tell us if if you don't mind and then we can move on to UNHLM if possible. So. Yes, we'll, we'll be going back 16 years ago when I contracted this disease. And it's not the usual disease of uh, pulmonary. I had tuberculosis in the brain, uh, TB meningitis. It happened to me right after two years of practicing my job as an architect. So I I was doing my work and, of course, doing all of these, uh, we'll call this um, extra overtime work for me to be able to to actually have a good career. And of course, transfer to another country and then elope with my husband, with my husband now. That was a that's a, that was the whole idea of 16 years ago. But this happened to me unknowingly. It was actually transferring from from pulmonary to the back of my neck. And then there it's basically eating up the the covering of my brain. And then I collapsed on the New Year's Eve of 2006. That's when they just couldn't understand what's happening with me. They just said it's just normal flu, fever, just migraines. But turns out the bacteria is already eating my brain in and out. And there they did not diagnose me properly. There were no tools that I'm, no means to actually check anything, uh, any bacteria or virus in my spinal fluid. That's why they just assumed it's tuberculosis, but they don't know what kind, what mutation. So they let me try the first time medication, six months, four tablets, I mean four types. But I think at the time it was around 10 to 16 pieces. And then uh, on my sixth month, they rushed me again to the hospital because my neck was actually blowing out of proportion. And then just they, they told me, sorry, we did not expect that the three out of the four medications don't work in your body. It turns out you're a resistant case. You'd have to triple the duration and then double the medication. So there I ended up having... Uh, drug-resistant tuberculosis for 24 months. That's back in 2007 to 2009 and lost my vision completely. And yeah, that's what I've been advocating now, how to lessen these kinds of irreversible effects, get these new tools so that nobody has to suffer the way I did. And of course, uh, being in this kind of triple discrimination women, woman, a person with disability, and also a person who had tuberculosis. Those are the, always, uh, I've been consistent with uh, the advocacies I've been doing this second time around in the UNHLM. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing this, Louis. Very uh, courageous of you and very, very powerful uh, and very moving story. It's such so humbling to see the struggle. And not only you survived, but you have also risen to, uh, to, to ensure that no one is blind to these issues, which are so important. Mm -hmm. And there's so much more we can do. So, uh, so Louis, please tell us, uh, you know, the, the, it was very historic when world leaders met in 2018 at the UNHLM yes. on TV. First time they got together to address an issue which was probably, uh, you know, uh, changing lives like it did for you, the bacteria. It, uh, you know, like for so, so, so many years. So, uh, but they met in 2018. They, they made very important promises. Have they delivered? Um, for me, the, the one that I was, uh, and we'll call this the panel that I was actually um, collab, call this, um, making noise, it was on equity. I was basically telling them about the 20% that has to be persons with disability globally. And up to now, I... I'm just really seeing some struggle on how to take care of those with disability who can also have tuberculosis. I ended up having this disability and I was able to discover those who are deaf, not being pro uh, provided with a service delivery, the, those children with autism who has primary complex, they, did, they just don't take care of them. So it's a struggle, but of course, with the help of some of our international um, supporters, we were able to really do some sur survey uh, programs, provide them with toolkits on how to uh, provide these kinds of 
you know, uh, strategies for those with community rights and gender issues. So it's, uh, no, I don't see any changes, but I, I know that some some percentage in the community who listens to to our um, advocacy is able to to help us, you know, start from start, start from somewhere. Right, right. A very important issue, Louis, which you are pointing to, and this has come up earlier also. Uh, I mean, is this an opportunity to bring TB rights and disability rights together? It is important to so that uh, you know there can be more synergy between that in terms of human rights. Yes. Good. When when I was in Netherlands uh, for the union, um, we also had the what do you call the disability committee. We've already created that one. I have friends there from from India, from uh, from Africa, where we're all with disability, deaf, and also mobility impaired. And I was the the one representing the the, the visually impaired. And the the idea that we we just really had to start somewhere, and because of of course the pandemic, we weren't able to proceed. But we now have the TB People Global Decla Declaration of Rights of Persons with TB. We also have our long-lasting 2000, um, we call this aid signed here in the country, the United, United Nations Convention for the Rights of Persons with Disability. All we have to do is just connect these international uh, documents because it was written for us, for those who are marginalized. And it's just a matter of really bringing the voice together. And we, we got to create um, a, a, because effective strategies so that other countries could actually uh, scale out, you know, copy so that everybody can be can be able to have that kind of group that they can uh, reach out for. Then let's hope more action happens on on, on those lines. So, uh, so yes. Louis, can you please tell us, uh, yeah, and, uh, you know, when you, a uh, lot has changed since you, uh, m would have tested been tested for uh, TB, right? Like in 2006 yes. uh, or so. And uh, now WHO recommends molecular tests uh, up front mm. when the f for a person who has presumptive TB. The the first test we should be offered is uh, should be a molecular test. So, so please sh uh, share some insights on that. If you think about it, if I had that kind of point of care provided for me, and because even if I had an extra pulmonary tuberculosis, my facility was still checking if it goes, it's, it's going back to my pulmonary. So that's the, that's the whole assumption that, that is, if you don't uh, call this, um, fight the bacteria properly, it will still go back to the pulmonary and get uh, near, I'd call this your close contacts be infected again. Or uh, those kinds of um, monthly checking was not provided for me back then. And at the same time, if, if ever that we, do get these these kinds of new tools provided for us without leaving the house. I'm blind, you know. Um, imagine I was going to the facility every single day with my mom and with my dad to just bring me there, let me drink the medication, and after thirty minutes, vomit in the car. That's what we do, and then and we we actually go home to our house, which is two cities away from where the facility was. So there, that uh, that's one of the uh, the most crucial part of my treatment. And then crying alone, and then there, when when uh, I heard about all of these uh, molecular molecular tests being provided now, I, just, I said unfair, but it has to, it has to happen sooner or later, because now I'm I'm hearing a lot of cases regarding they live in a faraway uh, region, far Jira, geographically isolated disadvantaged areas, and they have no means to actually go and uh, take these tests, which is across the. Uh, across the, what do you call this, um, the sea or the the river. So those, are, those are the kinds of challenges I've been hearing. And a good thing we have those evidences virtually. We're, we're getting all of these reports via our social media. But after now, who is going to be the one to uh, provide that kind of um, accessibility? So that's for those without a, a disability, for, for instance, that they're just apparently not able to provide that that um, financial, uh, what do you call this, um, support to, to these people who are living far away. So that's that's one area. What if they are a woman with children who cannot leave their kids uh, at home because nobody will be able to take care of these of these uh, kids? So it's another factor. What 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 more if you have a disability? Who will bring you to these um, molecular molecular testing who cannot be handheld? So those are the the things that I I can I definitely agree regarding all of these things being portable, 
the ECG that's going to be portable, that the of course our X-ray AI that's now going to be very good in wet reading. We can definitely screen a lot of hundreds of of um, residents in just one day. Everything can be done. It's just a matter of who will believe in this method. I I really hope that the UNHLM will give us a voice so they can see that it's just a it's a very easy mathemat mathematics. You just really have to fund this area so that uh, TB can really be controlled. Yes, totally, totally agree. Like l let us hope that happens too. Uh, you know, like we need to ensure that best of uh, diagnostics reaches the people uh, in yeah. need and. Mm. Uh, if they're not able to go to the laboratory, then the test needs to go to them. And it is very, mm. very important. Otherwise, we will not be able to LTB. And it is so, and it's also a human right issue. So, uh, so mm. Louis, what about the treatment? Like, uh, to what extent uh, is Philippines uh, rolling out the less toxic, shorter, uh, more effective treatment regimens? Um, I was very fortunate that my partner, Global TB Alliance New York, is able to introduce to me the new novel regimen. Back in 2019, I told them, I'm all, I'm all for the advocacy of the new novel regimen, but we have to introduce first the old ones because Filipinos up to up to now does not understand tuberculosis basic information and they don't know that it's free in our facilities. So we had to create materials. I created actually um, 32 videos on, in our YouTube channel, which has a uh, different dialects just to talk about the first-line medication drugs, the drug susceptible, drug resistant, the ITR, individual treatment regimen, and then the new novel regimen. All of these four uh, contexts are translated into eight dialects. We have 187 dialects in the Philippines, but I need, to, I need to start from the dialects that's basically used in the areas where we placed our operational research. And it was very successful. So many... Uh, uh, call this, um, went to our inbox, in our TV People of the Philippines inbox, asking for guidance because they had no idea about the free medication. And then there's an upcoming new novel regimen. So I was uh, thinking about, you know, approvals from our national TB program, the, the Disease Prevention and Control Bureau. We had a lot of, um, recall this, uh, revisions for the material that I created. I created the comics introducing also all of these four um, med uh, regimens and it clicked. They, they, uh, the, the idea that I'm uh, targeting the audience in a more attractive manner of IEC materials, information, education, and communication materials. And then we're now up to uh, the creation of the new manual. The new manual is actually about the new drug sensitive, uh, uh, we call this treatment first line, which is the HPMZ. And then, of course, our new novel regimen for drug resistance, which is the BPAL, BPAL M. But then again, we still have to wait for the manual. So we need to get the to get the manual first before I turn it into laymanized version again. So the, they promise it's going to be in October. But then again, we recently heard uh, I recall this a rising rate of drug resistant uh, cases. Uh, so they 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 cannot provide the new novel regimen up to now. So they have to convert to the 18 months. So that's the situation now in the Philippines. They're all waiting for when the man will, will be out. And I'll go ahead and advocate again for the 17 regions of the country. Yes, thanks a lot. And, and uh, we will share the link to uh, to the TV people YouTube with your 32 Video. Yes, this thank is you. Very for that. important for uh, you know for the people to uh, see that. So, uh, so Louis, uh, before we hear your message for the world leaders at the upcoming UNHLM uh, on twenty second September, uh, can, can we please uh, can you please share with us what motivated you to uh, found TB people in Philippines? I have been uh, doing some sort of a. Uh, lobbying 101 to all of my to all of my audience it seems that they they're forgetting the public governments governance the basic ones i'm going back to a 1991 republic act that lobbying can be, only be done by residents that's why now with with my current project with stop TV partnership challenge facility for civil society i'm teaching survivors to be the demand generation makers i want them to see that there has to be that call from the ground to for, for the local chief executives to actually fund the soon-to-be-devolved 
primary care, everybody has to be ready for that to happen. I mean, Global Fund cannot be there forever. We have to accept that one. And at the same time, we know that there's money there. It's just that nobody's asking for it. We need to look for ways on how to create that convincing power, you know, that convincing uh, power of the survivors to make sure that the proper allocation of budget can be provided by the, the ones who are sitting. At the same time, community um, convincing. There are still a lot of populations in this country who does not believe about these airborne communicable diseases. And at the same time, they don't understand the whole idea of drinking more than two months of medication. So it's just really a convincing uh, problem. We don't know who to con who should be convincing. We still don't know how that person sh uh, should be taught how to convince. And at the same time, who, could, who to convince. Those kind of supply and demand they seems to be uh, forgotten by, by the community. And I don't think it's just here in the Philippines. Everybody globally has been forgetting that there has to be that kind of um, providing the power to the people. It's not, it's not just about medicines, diagnostics, it's not just about, it's not just about, um, it's not just about budget. It's also how you can really help the person with the disease or without the disease be prepared and re to really fight the fight. So I think um, we, will, we will be doing a long, a long way or more years for this one. But I, I, I can see, I can see clearly that that's really the key. We have to know how to convince people how to to make their their themselves uh, healthier. So yeah, I may not design structures anymore, but I know how to design healthier lives. Very powerfully articulated, and this so true. So, uh, any any final thoughts, uh, Louis, before we wrap this up? Okay. I hope. Yeah, I hope. Thank you, Bobby, for for this interview. I'm really excited because uh now this time around, back in 2018, I had no group. I was just really a standalone community representative. Now I have TP people behind me. I have uh, almost 500 members now. With just a three years of uh, existence, I was able to really cultivate or, I guess, um, make more lobbyists, make more little Louis in, in my country. And I hope that everybody everybody sees that it's just just a matter of step by step, collecting all of these evidences and making making that that very effective uh, effective. Uh, because um maybe more of a pressure, effective pressure to those who are in, in the in the protocol or those who are in power. But we know that even if we are little, uh altogether we have the we have the bigger bigger chance of making these these changes locally and internationally. So thank you for, for this opportunity again, Bobby. Thank you so much, Louis. Absolutely. And now you have 501 people in TB people. It's me also included <laughs> as a volunteer for sure for life. So thanks a lot, Louis. All power to you. All power to you always and all through. And uh, let us hope that you are really able to, you know, for change and influence the world leaders and uh, to, to for them to commit to very pro-people, people-centric policies. We need to early and accurate diagnosis of people. We need decentralized molecular tests to reach people. We need the best of treatments. We need to make sure TB prevention becomes a reality. It is not a reality TB prevention for 10.6 million people who get TB every year. So let us hope a lot more people-centric policies happen and take shape with force forceful leaders and advocates like you or in the driving seat. So best of wishes and thanks a lot and special thanks for speaking with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll do my best. Take Thank care. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Take care.